Good afternoon. I'm John Paul, professor of the history of Christianity in North America. Uh, I'll be moderating our conversation today on tough texts related to gender and sexuality. Thank you so much for coming out. I look forward to our conversation. Without any further ado, I want to introduce the president of the seminar, seminary, Reverend Dr. Philip Cray, to say a word of welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Paul. I think in your program it says uh, uh, Dean Paul Roger Shekhar. I am not Dean Paul Roger Shekhar. He's sitting uh, in the back, but on behalf of the dean, our faculty, our student body, and the Board of Trustees, welcome to this second in a series on, on tough texts. Uh, it is most appropriate that, that we do this. I know when the idea first came up, uh, I immediately uh, joined with uh, Dr. Roger Shekhar and Dr. Paul and uh, Mark Staples and so many others who have been part of the, the, the planning team uh, in saying it's a necessary thing to do. Uh, I've lived uh, in Mount Airy for now almost 20 years, and I've watched how Mount Airy has changed. And uh, if, if we think that we will always live in peace with one another without dialogue, I think all we need to do is watch the flashpoints around the world and even watch the flashpoints in our own country, um, in our own communities. Uh, dialogue is, is most necessary. And so uh, I deeply appreciate, we deeply appreciate your being here and your willingness to, to participate, especially on today's topic. So uh, thanks to the presenters. Uh, no students are allowed to leave this place without uh, 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 focusing in part, as our dean said last week, on interreligious uh, dialogue. It's a requirement uh, in our curriculum. That's, that's how much we, we value it. And uh, so again, thanks for being here. And let us all pray together for peace among the religions of this world, because that is really at the heart of so much of the conflict uh, around the world, and so what you are doing is blessed by God. Thank you. I need to rush off. I've, we get a bunch of prospective students coming, so don't discount the, the value of this for, for what I have to do in another role. They're coming to my house, and I'd better be there. <laughs> Just a few words about uh, the plan for the afternoon. Um, you've all received a schedule. Um, each speaker will speak for about 20 minutes, and I will not introduce them because you have uh, extensive biographies about each of them in the flyer uh, as well. I also won't interrupt the flow of the conversation by standing up in between uh, the presentations. Uh, the speakers have agreed to flip the script of history uh, a little bit and start with our Muslim speaker, uh, Dr. Constance Carter, uh, and then go to our Christian speaker, uh, Dr. Wilda Gaffney, and uh, conclude with our Jewish speaker, Dr. Laura Levitt. Um, each speaker, again, will speak for about 20 minutes, <clears throat> uh, and then we'll break into small groups immediately afterwards. Uh, we won't have a, an immediate plenary question and answer time, uh, but after our third speaker, I'll simply stand up and invite you to go to the small groups to which you are assigned. Uh, they're listed on the sheet. Um, Benbo, is this A? This is C, okay, good. Um, so there are three rooms along this corridor. Benbo A is the room farthest from here, B is in the middle, and we are in C. Um, if you are not assigned to a group, uh, simply feel free to uh, pick the group that looks the most interesting to you and uh, join uh, that one as well. Thank you again so much for being here. Uh, my own work um, most recently has been on the field of religion and violence in America. And I introduced the book that I've just finished on that topic by talking about the violence iceberg. How at the tip of the iceberg is um, overt physical violence, but underneath that obvious manifestation of violence um, are social systems, inequities in health care, and education that produce suffering just as surely as a gunshot and in fact, more slowly and with greater agony for greater numbers of people. But even that's not the bottom of the violence iceberg. At the bottom of the violence iceberg is language. 
the ways we describe the world, the motivations we live by, the metaphors that engage us. Today we have the opportunity to hear three speakers <clears throat> talk about the problems and prospects of some of our texts in relationship to gender and sexuality. So we're right at the bottom of the iceberg <clears throat> where perhaps uh, we can find some flow that can melt some of that violence away. I certainly look forward to all three uh, speakers. Please join me in welcoming uh, them. Dr. Carter. <clears throat> Thank you and good afternoon. I would like to thank uh, Mark Staples, the director of the Faith and Life Institute for inviting me to speak on foundational scripture and its relevance to challenging gender and sexuality issues in contemporary Muslim practices. When I ponder over tough texts found in the Quran and in its translation, several controversial issues regarding the status of Muslim women come to mind. The following are some of the major issues involved. Number one, controversy rages concerning the nature of women and whether the nature of women is significantly different from that of men. What are the aspects of this alleged differences? And does this difference, if it exists, entail any interesting sociological consequences which would justify the Islamic tendency to accord a special character to the place and role of women in society? Number two, what is the relation of women to men? Is it one of absolute equality? Or are there certain fields and areas in which men in general can attain superiority over women. Where is where he is naturally qualified for leadership and guardianship over women? Number three, controversy also rages over the rights of the two sexes. Should those rights be identically equal in all circumstances? Or are there certain contexts in which discrimination is favored of men could be more equitable and egalitarian, and where identity and absolute equality would be less? Number four, discussion also arises concerning the role a woman is expected to play in society, and whether that role can be reconciled with her main basic role as the mainstay of family life. Number five, related to the issue of women's social role is the question of the manner in which she is to mix with men outside the circle of close relatives and members of her family, how she is to dress in public, and so on. Today, I won't be able to speak on each of these controversies, <laughs> but I will present some of the textual or scripture root of these gender and sexuality issues. According to my research and the opinion of Muslims and non-Muslim contemporary scholarship, there is a verse in the Quran, which is chapter four, verse 34, which is considered as the pivotal verse that has caused the most conflict around the status of Muslim women. The translation of this, uh, the meaning of this verse may read, Men have charge over women because God has preferred the one above the other and because they spend their wealth on them. Right acting women are obedient, safeguarding their husband's interests in his absence as God has guarded them. If there are women whose disobedience you fear, you may admonish them, you may refuse to sleep with them, and then you should beat them. But if they obey you, do not look for a way to punish you, for God is most high, the most great. Now this is tough text, both in the Arabic and in his translation. Muslim tradition tell us that this verse defines the division of labor, specifically of husband and wives, and of men and women in general. This verse is accepted throughout the Muslim world and in the Muslim community in America, as the Islamic adab, which means order 
etiquette, manner of doing things. So it is the etiquette for Islamic marriages as well as it defines how Muslim husbands should treat their wives. Moreover, it structures gender roles, responsibilities, and rights for all Muslims. Yet out of the more than 6,000 verses found in the Quran, which gives guidance for correct conduct for both men and women, 434 in conjunction with another verse, which is 222-228, has been translated and interpreted in such a way that some scholars hold that God has given men a degree above women because God has made one excel the other that he prefers men over women because men have more intelligence and are superior to women. Such an interpretation has provided the textual biases and basis for some men to believe that they have authority and power over women. Yet in the Quran, strong family values are emphasized over and over again. The family is seen as the cornerstone of Muslim society and is the woman who is, is central to the family institution. However, it is in the realm of the family system itself where she is faced with the most controversy in reference to her status as a free, liberated individual. Her role as a wife and mother is considered as inferior position to that of her husband. Opponents of Islam invariably point to this verse as the basis of this argument that Islam is quite oppressive to women. Many of them view the English translation as scripture authority. Hence, they depend on it for their understanding of this verse. There are also many Muslim men and women who also take that same position and believe that God himself has given men unquestionable superiority over women. Further, some contemporary scholars hold that these translations are grounded in patriarchal politics and as a result, marginalize and disempower women. These gross misunderstandings, misinterpretation of Quran 434 has caused the most tension and confusion in reference to the status of Muslims both men and women. It has led some men to treat women unfairly both in family and public lives. The problem is one, this problem is one that has definitely caused the breakdown of the Muslim family structure. Now I did a study and I interviewed Muslims, uh, male and females, to see about uh, their understanding of this verse. And two respondents in my study recall how this verse impacts on real life uh, situation. We think that it is a problem to pick up the verse and say, I can beat my wife. As police officers, we know there are so many Muslim men locked up for beating their wives, and they actually believe they have the power to discipline their wives like that, and they further the ignorance to others. That is the first thing that comes out of their mouths. You can't lock me up. This is my religion. This is in my holy scripture. There was one officer who said, well, this is their religion. And we said, no, it is a problem. The misunderstanding is a problem. To substantiate this, I found that many English translations are quite problematic. They do not give the most appropriate meaning of what God is saying in reference to this verse in questions. Now, um, in my research, I was able to find the first translation of the Quran, and it was right here at the Lutheran Seminary. Uh, <laughs> and um, Alexander Ross, who uh, is an Oriental, who was an Orientalist, translated the verse, uh, that verse. And he was the first one to do that. However, he didn't translate from Arabic. He translated from French. And it was said, based off of my study, that he was not even a French scholar. However, <laughs> however, his translation has um, impact on all of the translations that follow. I just want to read his translation, please. Well, first, he starts off in his introduction by saying that um, 
He thought he would bring this translation to his colors that uh, fought for viewing the enemy in their full body. Obviously, he had some anti-sentiments against Islam. So he said this book is for Christians to help them to view their enemy um, so that they may be better to prepare to encounter and I hope to overcome them. You're speaking about hard texts. This is another hard text. Um, and it's a translation. So let me just, and it took me a while to find a translation because um, this is a very old text. It was translated in the year 1600. And so there's no indication where the verse stopped and in. So I had to go through all this to find this verse, but I found it, okay? And it says, men should have authority over women they should have them in their keeping. They should have in their power the wealth that God has given them and should have care of what shall be convenient uh, to be expended for them. Discreet and obedient wives observe in their husband's absence the commandments of God, make remonstrances to them that shall be disobedient and remove them from their beds and chastise them. Now, this is the verse that unfortunately influenced all of the verses, all of the translations that came after him. And there's a lot of concerns with this verse in his translation. Um, he forgot to translate some of the lines in the verse. And it's this Arabic term called kawamuna which he says, um, he translated that men have authority, but the literal translation of this verse is caretaker, supporter, guardian, and whatever. But as I said, he, um, he made several mistakes. Um, yet in regard to this verse, Ross's translation is the foundation for all subsequent English translations, both by Muslims and non-Muslims. Therefore, there has been little or no progress in translating, interpreting, and understanding of this, which is still today the most misunderstood verse in the Quran. One primary reason is that due to historical controversy with the translatability of the Quran, Muslim scholars did not really start translating until the year 1900. And I don't want to go into all of it, but a lot of the Muslim scholars felt like, oh, you can't translate. You have to leave it in the Arabic text. But there's been, there was indication and there was statements around this is a universal uh, way of life. This is a universal religion. So in order to make it attractive to people who don't speak Arabic, you have to do some translation. But yet the scholars didn't feel that way, and they waited until the year 1900 to, do the, uh, to translate it. By that time, the Orientalists had taken the lead. And so when Muslims did start translating, they used the Orientalist work as a starting point, and that was a problem. Okay, so there were several Orientalists. It was about nine Orientalists that I studied, but one in, in particular, his name is Palmer, and his work was similar to Ross. However, he is the one who originated the word beat. Okay, and then of course we have our Muslim scholars who translated Pitfall, Yusuf Ali. I'm just going to mention what Pitfall said because his work is widely used throughout the uh, American Muslim community. And um, you know, uh, first of all, the beat, the word beat is bad sounding enough, and you know when you get beat, it hurts. So. You know, I didn't appreciate that. But then uh, Pitfall uses the words uh, scowl, scourge, scourge, yeah, scourge them, which sounds even worse, okay? And out of all the translations that I um, examined, there was one that I thought was the most offensive to Muslim women, and that one is by Ahmed Muhammad Asfak, and um, that was done in 1992. And he starts off by saying that men are made lords over women. 
for that God has given greatness to them. So I found that to be the most offensive. However, in view of all the things that I'm saying, we still have many Muslim, American Muslims who read, accept, interpret, understand, and apply translations of the Quran as if it, they are scripture authority, and they're just translations, okay? It's not the Quran. Um, as for some Arabic speaking Muslims around the world, their concern, of course, is not due to translation as they can read the original Arabic, but oftentimes their culture and tradition may conflict with the true essence and ideals of Islam. They miss the true understanding and wisdom found in the original language of the Quran. To substantiate what I'm saying, I found that Muslim culture and Islam are not synonymous. Islamic culture is based on the original scripture, the Quran and the Sunnah, which is the tradition of who Muslims believe were the, who uh, was the last and final prophet, Prophet Muhammad. So it's what he said, what he did, what he believed in, what he approved. And uh, under Islamic understanding, he was the one that God himself had given something called isma, which is infallibility when it comes to interpreting and translating and understanding and applying the injunctions in the Quran. Okay, so um, Muslim culture, however, is based on people and their traditions and customs. Thus, Islam is interpreted and practiced based on a person's tradition, their customs, um, and it's, it may be different depending on the culture of the different groups. Sometimes Muslims will believe that they are actually following the tenets of their faith when they're actually following their native cultures and traditions that may predate Islam. This may account for the differences in practices and dress and mannerism. So what are some of the solutions to this hard text or tough text? I forgot, it's tough text, right? Yep. Okay, for me it's exegesis or tafsir and you should have a high quality introduction to help the reader to get the best understanding of tough text. The Arabic word taf, uh, tafsir comes from another Arabic term, uh, fasara, which means to explain, to expound, to elucidate, to interpret. A tafsir is a scholarly work dedicated to elucidating the meaning of revealed text use, using nuances of language, history, tradition, and of course the sunnah or the tradition of the prophet, and of course the, the Quran itself. For instance, it is the work, the combined work of many of the classical scholars that I study and the contemporary exegesis that I was able to discern the most appropriate explanation of Quran 434. Now an acceptable translation is something like this. Men should have, or men shall be responsible for the full care of women, using that which God has provided to them over what he has provided to women, and that what they spend from their wealth or their own means. And the righteous women are truly devoted ones who guard the intimacy. The word in Arabic for intimacy is el ghaib, G-H-A-Y-B. And that has to do with the secrecy, the privacy, the intimate conversations between men and women, uh, pillow talk or whatever, <laughs> but <laughs> that's pretty much what it is. And sometimes those things should stay behind closed doors. But God, <laughs> So, so pretty much that's what a woman should guard. As for those who uh, you fear, and the, and the term for disobedient, uh, dis disobedience, and I'll explain that later, but it's called nishus, and it's really marital discord. If you fear that, you should first admonish them, and that's to remind them um, about their uh, connection and their relationship to God. Next is to refuse to share their bed and then chastise them. And it says hit them lightly, but I'll explain that. And if there is no problem, do not seek any harm against them. Now for me, 
exegesis brings clarity to English translation. For instance, in contrast to the English translation of the concept of Kabamuna, which has been translated as people, men are in charge, have control, have authority over women because God has made them superior. Okay. The exegesis uh, gives a clear ex explanation. That is, men are maintainers, they're responsible for the full care of women because God has given men a degree above. Now, what is this degree? The, the uh, degree could be responsibility for one. It is also inheritance, because men get more in inheritance, women get less, but men have to take care of families. Men are responsible for all the women in their household and women in general. Women do not have to use their inheritance money or any of their money to take care of basic things, food, clothing, shelter, all those things, or pay bills. When they do, it's a special charity and they get special blessings for that, okay? They're not obligated to do these things, however men are, okay? And in today's society, as you know, women work, I work, but whatever I do in that household is not an obligation, it's a charity, okay? And, and if my husband doesn't do anything, he's gonna be held accountable, <laughs> not me. <laughs> Okay, so that degree is something that God gave to men to help them to be kind because the prerequisite for that status of Kabamuna is kindness and generosity. Okay, those are the prerequisites. Okay, so men should treat women with kindness. Okay, um, in reference to the shoes or disobedience. That's when a woman, and, 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 and God did speak on that. That is any act of defiance towards God himself, okay? And then towards their God-fearing husband, okay? Um, and she shows arrogance. Um, she may want to get out the marriage, but she stays in the marriage. But she is thinking about somebody else, or she has interest in somebody else, and she stays in the marriage, even though she can get a divorce and get out of it, okay? Um, it's not adultery because there are reprimands in the Quran for adulteries, but this is reprehensible enough for it to have those type of corrections or those type of uh, injunctions in that verse, okay? Um, however, um, this verse, is restricted by the prophet's tradition. For he never hit his wives. His separation was enough to resolve the marital conflict, okay? Uh, while the majority of traditions give evidence that the prophet strongly disapproved of hitting women, he did stip stipulate in his farewell address that hitting as a deterrent should be only be resorted if the wife had been guilty in an obvious manner of immoral conduct, okay? So the prophet could not abrogate what God said in the Quran. He did say he hit, okay? But what we need to be mindful is that everything that's in the Quran tells us who to worship, but it's the prophet's sunnah or tradition that tells us how to worship. For instance, if we make ablution, which is ritual washing, God tells us in the Quran to do it, but he doesn't explain how to do it. The sunnah of the prophet, the prophet himself will say, we well, have to wash your hands three times, or you have to do this, or you have to do that. So there, in every injunction, there is a, a way that the prophet shows us how to do. So with this verse, it shouldn't be an exception. So the prophet never hit, so my position is that men should not hit, because it might lead to the battle of the sexes, because women might hit back. So, but at any rate, <laughs> um, pretty much, I know I'm running out of time, but I just want to end up by saying that uh, most of the respondents in my work the women especially uh, felt like God is not oppressive. When I read the Quran, I know it's all positive, and I depend on tafsir or exegesis for clarity. And as one woman put it, I think that women get it and men do not. <laughs> this verse is bait for men. 
Men want to make something else, something different. Not all men. I have a good husband. <laughs> something different than what God has intended it to be. It was never intended to oppress women. But certainly, it is hard text. I don't want to go in any further, but in the Quran, it's gender mutuality language. The, the language in the Quran does stress men and women getting along together, uh, uh, Along together, there's so many verses that deal with the egalitarian concept, but concept of believing men and believing women. And so, I just want to end there. But definitely, again, this is a tough text. And if we don't study it, if we just pick up the book and read it, we truly will get a misunderstanding of a tough, tough text in the Quran. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh -oh. I also want to extend my thanks to uh, Mark and John and the community behind this program, and certainly to Dr. Carter for getting us started in such a great way. Uh, obviously, as a professor of Hebrew and Hebrew Bible, I love exegesis and I love language study. So uh, that was wonderfully done. My talk today is going to be about the practices, a specific practice of abduction, rape, and forced marriage in Jewish and Christian scriptures. Contemporary conversations about marriage in our American uh, cultural society frequently invoke the biblical text as an authority to define marriage, its nature and its constituents. The term biblical marriage is regularly employed as though it denotes a constant fixed norm. Alternatively, the expression traditional marriage is invoked. Speaking as a biblicist, there is in fact no specific term in biblical Hebrew for marriage. There are socially accepted conjugal unions in the text, but the smallest level of the Israelite kinship system is the Beit Av or Beit Am, Beit Im, the father's household or the mother's household, which could include a dozen members of the combined, immediate, and extended family. There is no concept of the conjugal couple as a distinct unit in the Hebrew scriptures. Now there is an overarching concern for sexual purity fertility, and clear determination of paternity. Legislation and social practices pertaining to rape address these concerns. The broader passage in Deuteronomy 22 is a useful starting place, and uh, you have that on your text. And I should say that the handout was originally in color, and I forgot to make it black and white, which is why the, the names of the text and some of the numbers are virtually invisible. Uh, but it starts with Deuteronomy 22. This text describes rape as a crime and its consequence in ancient Israel. It is only concerned with marriageable girls. That is, it does not address the rape of a married woman. It doesn't address the rape of a widowed woman. It doesn't address rape of servant women. It doesn't address rape of women outside of biblical Israel. The lack of concern for married women is surprising given the need to be able to establish paternity. However, these texts seem to suppose that unmarried, sexually uninitiated girls are the most likely targets of rape. In this construction, the purpose of rape seems to be primarily to acquire progeny. Subsequent texts demonstrate that this practice is regularly carried out at the expense of a vanquished foe. These rapes for progeny and their social and religious constructions are my primary focus here. So I use the term rape marriage to describe forcible conjugal cohabitation. In the Israelite context, it is typified by the seizing of sexually immature and inexperienced girls as conjugal partners, particularly, although not exclusively, in the course of armed conflict as the spoils of war, booty, or plunder. 
The concept has passed almost unnoticed into the lexicon of American English and African American cultural rhetoric in which booty has been reduced from a whole person to a person's anal and genital orifices usually accessed from the back. And there is the most recent expansion of the lexicon to include bootylicious. Given the ongoing colonization and exploitation of African American sexuality, particularly female sexuality, I find the veneration of a young woman who proclaims the deliciousness of her own booty fascinating. I'm describing these particular unions as marriages because in their social context, they are legitimate conjugal unions. In the text, they produce children who are recognized as legitimate members of the Israelite community. They're even developed statutes regulating the practice and offering some limited protections to the abducted women and their children. And I'm describing these unions as rape marriages because not only is there no consent to these unions and the concomitant sexual intercourse in the contemporary sense, but more importantly, there is no consent to these unions in the narratives in the consent rituals of the time. The normative practices associated with conjugal unions in the Hebrew scriptures, such as negotiation between families, consent of the parents, or consent of the woman herself are not present in these narratives. Beginning in the Torah, there is a trajectory of the evolution of rape marriage, starting with Numbers 31. Moses, in spite of his own marriage to a Midianite woman, and in spite of his relationship with his Midianite father-in-law by any name, and that's a whole nother lecture, whatever Moses' father-in-law's name is, which leads to the establishment of the judicial system in the wilderness, Moses calls for the virtual annihilation of the Midianite people into whom he has married. Now, to be fair, it is Moses' God who calls for this vengeance for an unspecified offense. Interpreters in the canon, as well as those subsequent to the arbitrary and putative closing of the canon, have tried to link the Midianite women to the apostasy of Baal Peor. Uh, there was a time when the Israelites worshiped in an unorthodox way, and there was an attempt to blame that on the women from this community into which Moses married. But in the story about that uh, business, those women were not actually involved, so that was just sort of a later uh, linking. So there is this state, this statement that is made by God. God says, harass the Midianites and defeat them. Uh, and in the course of the, that's in Numbers 25, 17. In the course of the battle, uh, which follows in Numbers 31, uh, we find that the Israelites take captive women and uh, flocks and other possessions. And Moses asked uh, first, well, why are these women uh, still alive? Uh, and then he says, well, make sure you kill all of the males, particularly among the little ones. And the word uh, tapanim in biblical Hebrew means toddlers. It's got the sound of a drum. So when we think of the pitter-patter of little feet in English, it is that kind of little person. And the story tells us that uh, thousands of sheep, and in verse 35, 32,000 human souls from women who had not known men by sleeping with them. Uh, that's the number of what we would call children, uh, prepubescent and pubescent girls who were uh, available for and subsequently raped into marriage. Now, after God says, harass them, it is Moses who says, well, pull out the women and the girls who are not sexually experienced. So in this way, this introduction of rape marriage is Moses' own idea as to what God means uh, when God says take vengeance. God doesn't spell out very much in the Quranic system how to take vengeance. And Moses says, well, I know. We'll just kill the baby boys and keep the women. Um, so all of, uh, let, me, let me move a little further. So this principle of how to do the thing that God commands uh, in the biblical text is sometimes called, uh, in one tradition of exegesis, building a fence around the Torah. Uh, how do you do the thing uh, that God commands? And uh, Moses' response is certainly a tough text. But it, practice does not end 
in Numbers, it continues, and in Deuteronomy, the practice becomes standardized. In chapter 20 and chapter 21, uh, there are lengthy discussions of this practice. Now the practice has been refined so that this practice is waged against women who belong to a group of people who are characterized as the enemy, whoever the enemy are. All of their women are now available for forced cohabitation. Secondly, the Israelite men may now choose among the women of the enemy based on their appearance. Uh, if you like one, you can have one. And it's no longer a requirement that those women be sexually uninitiated. And in these chapters, the Israelites have developed a protocol for breaking in the new woman. Uh, it's a humiliation-based protocol that consists of shaving the woman's head and cutting her nails. I think that's a practical step uh, to protect the rapist husband. And there is a stripping of her uh, using a type of causative verb stem in biblical Hebrew, uh, the hifil, which means that it's a forcible stripping. And the text ends there without the provision of clothing for the woman. So this naked, shaved woman bereft of her nails is given a month to mourn for her mother and father and to accept her new situation. And then, whether she's ready or not, the Israelite male who chose her because he desired her is giving divine slash mosaic authority, and the two voices are presented as one, to penetrate her, literally to come upon her, presumably uh, holding her down if necessary. Women are abducted in other parts of the biblical text using a variety of vocabulary in Hebrew. In Judges chapter 20, Benjaminites refused to hand over uh, some men from a town called Gibeah who raped and murdered the wife of a religious person, a Levite. Uh, and as a result of the rape, murder, dismemberment of this Levite's wife, there was a war against Benjamin in which 25,000 male warriors were killed. In the aftermath of that battle, the remaining Israelite tribes swear that they will never give their daughters in marriage to the 600 survivors of Benjamin. There was one city that didn't get involved either in the battle or in the swearing. Because there was a concern that the tribe of Benjamin might die out, and everybody, as far as they knew, had decided they wouldn't intermarry with them, it was decided by somebody that they would go to this town that wasn't, wasn't involved in the war or involved in the swearing, and that they would simply abduct their women uh, for the tribe of Benjamin. So the congregation, this is now set in a religious context, the congregation sent 12,000 soldiers and commanded them uh, to put the entire inhabitants of the city, uh, Yavesh Gilad, to the sword, including the women who are sexually experienced, and again, the little people, uh, but the women and girls who are sexually unexperienced, who numbered 400, were reserved for these Benjaminite warriors. Now, there were 600 warriors, and they stole 400 women. You do the math. Some men were not happy, so they decided they needed to steal some more women. So at this point, the story diverges from the outline laid out in Deuteronomy, that it should people, be people who are designated as enemy folk. They now turn inward into Israel and go to Shiloh, which is a holy site. And at a festival for the God of Israel, there are some women participating in the liturgy in sacred dance. And if I were preaching this in my church, I would say they broke into the cathedral and hauled off half of the acolytes, right? Because this is not outsiders, this is insiders in the religious space. And as they advise these men on how to do it, one of the things that's interesting to me is in verse 22, they have figured out that men, husbands, fathers, brothers, are going to object to having their sisters, wives, and nieces, and daughters, not so much wives, sexually inexperienced, abducted. So this is what the text says. Well, if their fathers or brothers come to complain to us, we will say, be generous and allow us to have them because we didn't capture enough in the previous battle. But you didn't incur any guilt because you didn't give us to them. Someone has enough understanding to recognize that this abduction is a problem, but not nearly enough understanding to think that that answer would actually satisfy 
uh, anybody who was injured over having uh, a beloved daughter abducted. Some of the vocabulary that's used for the theft, abduction, and rape of women into marriage are words that are used of theft of property, including the verb nasa, which means to pick up or lift anything. For people in Christian tradition who are familiar with the beautiful language of Isaiah 6, where he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, it's that same verb. Uh, and so when a woman is lifted up into marriage, she is thrown over someone's shoulder metaphorically, but it's the physical lifting up and carrying off. And I've given you a number of texts in which some of that vocabulary is used uh, for theft of all sorts of things. And in each case, those words are used for theft of women. In that story in Judges where the women are abducted out of the religious context, that is the verb nasa, to lift up and carry off like a sack of potatoes uh, is my uh, translation uh, that is used there. Now, the book of Judges is a little bit helpful as a tough text in that it frequently comments that these horrible things are happening in biblical Israel. One, it acknowledges that these are horrible things, that they're not normative practices, that they're not appropriate. There's a refrain in the book of Judges. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and all the people did what was right in their own eyes. And this is repeated several times. Now, they think the solution is to have a particular type of theocratic government. But they are at least aware that these practices are barbaric. And so in Judges, uh, we get a critique in the text of these kind of practices. In a similar incident in 2 Chronicles, after the division of the monarchy, the Israelites, uh, those who remained in the northern kingdom after the division, abducted some women from the southern kingdom of Judah. But they didn't take them from Judah. They took them from a neighboring government. So there was sort of war on the border. And Aram took some Judean women. And the Israelites went and took those Judean women, but they didn't exactly free them. The prophet Oded, who only appears in this one place, objected to treating the Judeans as outsiders and urged the release of all the captives. Uh, and in 2 Chronicles 28, verses 8 and following, um, we get the story of the response to that prophetic word in which people then go into their houses and get clothing to put on these captives and bring them food. But were it not for the uh, intervention of the prophet, uh, those women would have been abducted uh, into marriage. So this was a double abduction. They got abduction, abducted by the Aramites and then abducted by the Israelites. As the biblical canon unfolds in its sequential order, most often this practice is carried out against foreign women. One of the places that I've written about extensively where it happens uh, is in a story of a character who's beloved by Jews and Christians alike, and that's the story of Ruth. And Ruth is romanticized and overly romanticized. But the book of Ruth opens in Hebrew by saying that Ruth and Orpah are abducted into marriage, that verb nasa that was used of the theft of the women from the liturgical dance setting in Shiloh is the verb that describes Ruth's entry into marriage. It was not a consensual union. Um, in a number of texts that, that I've left there for you, you see that a number of royal figures and other men are proving uh, their manhood or their strength or their power by abducting women, and particularly foreign women. And some of them have as a descriptor, and so-and-so abducted a number of women. And all of these foreign women, he carried off. And he had more wives, primary wives, and second wives than this kind of person. One of the verbs that's used of stealing women is a verb that's used of shepherding sheep. It's not a particularly pleasant imagery when it's applied to a human person. So this verb we actually find very early in the canon in Genesis when Jacob uh, sort of sneaks out of his father-in-law's property, takes his wives and children, and, and sort of tries to head off down the road in the middle of the night. And his father-in-law catches him and sort of circles around. Uh, and he says, well, what have you done? You've deceived me. And you carried away, using the shepherding verb, my daughters, as though they were captive women. You've driven out my daughters uh, like a herd of sheep. 
uh, and they come to some arrangement in the family about that. Now, as I've looked at the practice of rape marriage in the Hebrew scriptures, I would think that it would be objectionable on the grounds of exogamy. That is the way that it was regularly practiced. Because there are scriptures in the Hebrew Bible that forbid intermarriage with the people of the surrounding lands, usually on religious practices. They worship different gods. You shall not give your daughters in marriage to them. You shall not receive their daughters in marriage. And so I'm surprised to find that in the case of war, that prohibition gets set aside so that in these uh, occasions, Israelites are free and in fact authorized to go into these enemy communities and marry. There is a tradition of abduction and forced marriage that evolved throughout the Hebrew scriptures and endured. And I dare to say that the practice endured in the text and endures in our world because it is effective. It demoralizes conquered peoples. And when the children of these unions are counted as the children of the victors, forced impregnation simultaneously builds up the community of the victor while eradicating the community of the conquered. Forced impregnation is a tool of genocide. In most of the cases, well, really in each case that I discussed, the women are available in part because they are outsiders. In the case of the Israelite women in Shiloh, even though they are closely abduct related to their abductors, they have been constructed as outsiders by making them available for abduction. They were closely related to their abductors, but not close enough to violate the oath of not giving their daughters to the Benjaminites. I'd like to make some final observations about the language of rape marriage in the Hebrew scriptures, and I've alluded to it. In each of the texts discussed above, the scholarly convention in translation, and Dr. Carter has given us a wonderful lecture in uh, reminding us how important translation is. If you read these passages, not in the RGT, the revised Gaffney translation that I've given you, but in your Bibles at home, you will see that the, that the victims of abduction marriage are usually described as women. But they are, in fact, not women. They are children. They are girls. They are pubescent and prepubescent girls. Whether these young women, young girls, are considered adults before their abduction and initiation and rape, it is very clear that in the world of the text, their initiation into womanhood is brutal. Rape marriage was a socially acceptable conjugal union in the worldview of the authors and editors of the biblical text and endures to this day in some parts of the world. There are certainly less vicious forms of biblical marriage. All biblical marriages are not abduction marriages, rape marriages, or forced marriages. But we cannot, particularly in the current era, invoke the language of biblical marriage without sanctifying the abduction and rape of teen and preteen girls, as that is a legitimate form of biblical marriage. Dr. Carter began with her questions. I'm going to end with my question. The question with which I am left is, is the abduction of girls and women for rape consummated marriages really a biblical phenomenon? I've looked at it in the biblical text. And I ask this question because the ongoing abduction of girls and women in Ethiopia and Christ in, in Christian and Muslim communities continues. There were as many and perhaps more than 70,000 women and girls abducted both ways across the border in the partitioning of Pakistan from India in Hindu and Muslim communities. And here in the United States, Buddhist immigrants from Burma slash Myanmar and Hmong Vietnamese stand criminal prosecution for abducting girls for marriage because of what they uh, articulate as their ancestral traditions. So as Dr. Carter suggested, is it not possible that in spite of the number of texts in the Jewish and Christian scriptures which legitimize abduction marriages, 
that there is something in the culture of the people who predated the text, which is why we find it in every culture under the heavens, that the biblical text then is a reporter and not requesting, directing, normatizing, or sanctifying the practice of rape marriage. Thank you. But I also want to thank all of you for coming out and for the organizers for, I can't help but straighten up, <laughs> um, the organizers for bringing us all together. And it's really a pleasure to be on the panel with my distinguished colleagues. Um, what I want to do is, um, is sort of build on some of what we've talked about thus far, but take us in a different direction. I am. Um, uh, did a handout, and I don't know if people did end up getting it or yes, okay, great. Um, and I, I decided to just give you um, a single tough text that uh, I will come back to eventually and that I hope you all will use in your discussions of actually um, the combination of these papers together. So where I want to begin, because I'm not um, an exegete and I'm not um, a scholar of ancient texts, but really someone who works in the contemporary period and has done extensive feminist work in Jewish studies and the intersection between feminist theory and the study of religion and the study of, Jew of Jewish text practices um, also into the present. So what I'm interested in talking about today is really thinking about after 30 plus years of feminist work in Jewish studies, and I'm going to really focus on Jewish studies, um, I want to sort of talk about the ways in which, in some sense, lots of things have changed, and in other ways, many things stay the same. Um, I'm reminded of a text I teach in my feminist theory class on domesticity and the problematics of that discourse when feminists use it, because um, the, way, the way it gets played out is the domestic chores are the things that people don't really want to do, like cleaning up and cooking and cleaning up again and washing the clothes. And these are repetitive practices. And if you really want to go far in the academy or in other places, you're supposed to be an innovator. You're supposed to be doing the new cutting edge work. And uh, alas, this domestic labor, or shall I say women's work, is never done. And so as much as we move forward, there are ongoing and painful legacies, like the ones we've just talked about and heard about, um, that persist into the present. And um, hearing about uh, those abduction texts, I can't help but think of uh, the crises in various places in Africa and around the globe that continue to haunt us with precisely the kinds of violence that, you know, somehow in the news media, we there's this assumption that all of a sudden these guys go into places that are um, violent and they rape women as a tactic in war, that this is somehow a new thing. Um, I think they need to hear my colleague's paper um, and begin to think about the problematics of this and the, and the assuming, and what it means to assume that this is a new practice, which is a way of separating ourselves from our own complicity in this long um, legacy. So I'm interested in, again, the ways in which these things both remain the same and change. Um, and what I want to do today is give you a sense of the kind of feminist theorizing that, um, that many of us are doing um, in the academy and the ways in which that plays out in relation to tough texts from my tradition. And I would say, again, given that we are talking about um, what some call the Abrahamic faiths or the peoples of the book, um, that book would be the book that we just heard about. And um, in some sense, we share these legacies um, and have to work together to figure out what to do with them. But we also have to recognize that we come to them um, through different lenses and through different scrims, whether they be translations or different traditions of exegesis. Um, so 
Let me just tell you a little bit about the kind of theorizing that I have in mind that I want to talk about as a, maybe a resource for thinking about other ways of imagining how we engage these um, tough texts. The work that I'm interested in um, is really informed by a literary turn in the humanities and the social sciences. The sort of attention to language that John Paul asked us to consider and his opening remarks. And it's not a mistake that we're talking about texts. I'm also interested in the kind of feminist work that is not simply looking for either um, uh, a way of simply liberating ourselves from these legacies because I don't think we somehow go into a different land or into a different place, maybe at the end of time, but that depends on your interpretation of that moment or if there is such a moment. I'm, um, I'm interested in um, the ways in which uh, instead feminists are deploying what some talk about as post-structural or post-modern theories and I see these theories as tools, tools that many of us are using to dismantle the structural relationships that we've been talking about. The kinds of inequities and violences that are perpetuated in the ongoing engagement with the same text over time. I'm interested in particular in the ways in which assumptions about gender get played out. And these include not just um, the kind of um, violences that we've heard about, whether that's um, the misunderstanding of what it means to beat one's wife. And of course, this is a tradition also in Jewish sources, medieval Jewish sources. I think of Susan Shapiro's work on Maimonides and the problematics of, of, of that trope in his work. Um, but it's also about um, the ways in which we think about even the sort of happy stories, like why is it that marriage is normative? Why is it that heterosexuality is normative? And that the ways in which we come to finding images and texts about women in some of our most sacred works from our various traditions end up being about marriage. And if it's not about marriage, it's about either the smoothing out of the relationship between sanctioned conjugal relations or unsanctioned conjugal relations. So that would be rape and marriage. Um, and I'm interested in challenging even that as the domain in which we imagine possibilities for what it means to be Muslim, Jewish, or Christian women in various kinds of traditions. Um, in order to get at that, the kind of theorizing I'm interested in recognizes the complexity of identities. We're not just a Jewish feminist, whatever that means in my case, um, but that we are multiple things. So that, And some of the things that make up our identities are even contradictory. So what does it mean to be um, a religious Jew who finds these texts, these are my sacred texts, and I am uh, deeply disturbed by them and angry at them and reject certain parts of them? What does it mean to have those things together? What does it mean to think about the ways in which we are American and therefore are interpolated into the world in different ways and are uh, responsible for some of the kinds of actions of even those who um, rule our country maybe against some of our will, maybe some of us didn't vote for the people in charge? Um, and the ways in which yet we are also still responsible for and accountable for the actions of the nation state that um, in where, where we live and where we pay taxes and in which we have gained tremendous privilege. So all of those things need to be thought about together. And when we think about identity and in these more complicated ways, my argument is going to be that that gives us some more room and some more um, leeway in thinking about some of the ways in which these texts can actually, we can admit the ways in which these texts can say things that we really both reject and yet haunt us. So I'm interested in the ways in which multiple and multiple and contradictory identities inform not only individuals but also communities so that I don't speak, although I am a Jew on this panel, I certainly don't speak for all Jewish communities, not even all Jewish communities in Philadelphia, not even all Jewish communities in um, this progressive 
sector of Philadelphia. Um, and it's very interesting because it, in, in terms of that, we have to think about the ways in which there are, um, there is a, a newly formed Lubavitch community in this area in Philadelphia. There's Mishkan Shalom and the various minions who don't all agree with each other at um, the Germantown Jewish Center, even on questions of gender, for example, and inclusion in a service, or the ways in which um, uh, Texts may be um, engaged in places like, um, some of you may know, this is the home of uh, Jewish renewal, so in Pnei Or, which might to some of you not look like a Jewish service at all. And on the other hand, there are also a lot of us um, who position ourselves as secular Jews, which sounds like an anomaly in the context of um, a seminary context. But all of these are, again, forms of contemporary Jewish expression, and I don't want to flatten them out, so that whatever I'm telling you is certainly partial. The ways in which it becomes normative are the ways in which it gets accepted by groups of people and enacted by those groups who may not also agree with each other. So a service at Pnei Or may look different from um, a service at the Germantown Jewish Center in its main sanctuary or even in one of its minions, much less at Mishkan Shalom. Again, just to give a very local example. And I want to embrace that contradictoriness, that messiness, and not see that as um, as a problem, but actually as um, an opening for other ways for us to consider how to engage with difficult text. So what are some of the implications of this way of beginning to theorize and think about these questions? Um, it means letting go of the fantasy, dare I say, or the desire that there is one true position whether that's our happy feminist position or the really real um, Jewish tradition that is sanctioned by um, some um, rabbinic authority, perhaps. But letting go of the idea that there is one that somehow um, can take precedence in some sense over all the rest, as if there's some objective one that you could get to. Um, second of all, it means um, that we, again, challenge the accepted, the real, um, the enacted, and to really think about the ways in which those notions of authority are invested by us and through our communities. So given all of this, um, I'm really interested in thinking about the text that's on your handout, which in some ways is a text that builds on um, some of the kinds of questions that were posed in the biblical text that you've just heard about. Um, this is a text from uh, rabbinic tradition. And again, I think that um, the first paper also suggests that we study, particularly the, in the context of the United States, Muslim and Jewish texts in a context that is overtly and in some ways covertly, um, even in its, quote, secular guise, Protestant. And therefore, in some ways, those of us who come from non-Christian traditions do so as minority communities in a dominant culture which is formed by, if not overtly, Protestant. Um, and that also has implications for Catholics, right? Um, so I, when I say that, um, I want to be clear that um, in some ways, I, I probably share um, with others in the room um, a discomfort in, sh in sharing my, my dangerous texts and hearing about biblical texts because I know Jews are um, figured even in a, in a Christian imagination or various Christian imaginations as that which is superseded, i.e. the Hebrew Bible because, you know, that's the really bad text and then the happy text is the Christian text. And we know that there are difficult texts in all of those traditions. And in in Jewish circles, the sort of post-biblical Jewish texts, the texts of um, the rabbis who are in some ways um, the dominant form, or the predominant form of various Jewish positions in the present, are those guys who are kind of the bad guys of the New Testament, right? They are the, the Pharisees. And um, so it makes me a little bit nervous sharing with you in some ways um, a rabbinic text, a text that is from post-biblical Jewish sources, sacred Jewish sources, um, and that address, I think, again, 
pretty disturbing questions about, about women, about rape, about the ways in which um, women show up in these texts or don't show up in these texts, and what is considered um, normative. So this is a Mishnah, which is an early text, which is then um, expounded upon in the Babylonian Talmud, which is, of, there are two Talmuds, but that's the sort of normative Talmud in that tradition. Um, so again, these are all caveats, again, to sort of um, make clear that we, we are all reading these things with many lenses. Okay, um, so let me just say that um, I came to this text, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about sort of my background with it. Um, I came to this text in the context of writing my first book, which is the one with the chair on the cover, um, <laughs> Jews and Feminism, the Ambivalent Search for Home. And it was my attempt to think about Jewish feminist identities using this kind of theory. And I was interested in going back to the sources of my tradition and looking for sort of where do the girls show up. And in the process of doing that, it turned out, usually it was in the context of some form of conjugal relation, not to be, not to be uh, mistaken for that um, biblical marriage, whatever that is in our contemporary construction of it, but the ways in which women figure in biblical, and I was particularly interested in rabbinic texts, in order to figure out ways of imagining my relationship to both the rabbinic tradition and to liberal Jewish sources, which were the communities out of which I emerged. And in the process of doing that, um, of course, I was confronted with the fact that women show up mostly in terms of marriage and um, its opposite. And so in the context of looking at Jewish marriage practices, I was really interested in the Jewish marriage contract. Um, the ketubah. Some of you may know that um, know this document because they're really pretty, um, and they've been revived in the present. Um, and if you go to the Jewish M Museum of American Jewish History here in town, there's a whole gallery filled with these beautiful um, these beautiful texts. Or you may have seen them in friends' living rooms and above their you know above their couches or in their dining rooms or in their bedrooms. But they're very beautiful, um, often illuminated, hand scripted texts, and um, I had some questions about what it meant to um, revalidate those texts in the present. And um, so in answer to those questions, I was really interested in, well, what does a traditional text say? And it's a whole question about sanctioned efforts to exchange the property. And it is a contract between, a, in, the, in the sort of traditional contract, it's a contract between men, um, between fathers and the man who is going to take possession of his daughter. And there are, you know, negotiations that take place, and not all of it is terrible, and there are ways in which contracts can be useful. But um, I was quite disturbed by this. And I was really looking for as ancient a version of this text that I could find. So I went to the Talmud, and I went to the tractate, or the, cha or the chapter, it's not a chapter, it's really like the volume of a, an encyclopedia. So I went to the volume, which would be, the gold leaf, of course, because it's a sacred text. And I was looking for um, you know, an extant um, version, because I don't work in ancient sources, of the Ketubah text. This is um, Tractate Ketubot, which is the plural of Ketubahs, which is the marriage contract. And lo and behold, in my process of going through this text in, in search of that document, which I never found, um, because it turns out it's a kind of extra legal thing, um, I discovered a text about rape. And, um, you know, I wasn't completely surprised because I knew about the biblical text. I wasn't completely surprised about what I found. But what struck me is in this text, which is on your sheet, um, there is a question that comes up about the pain of rape. And I thought, oh, the pain of rape. Maybe there's something about women here that might be important or might be helpful to me. And as it turned out, the text reads as you see. And my question was, well, what do we do with that? Because of the ways in which it conflates marriage, first 
intercourse in marriage with rape, isn't it? Do women always feel pain in intercourse? Um, and again, assuming that all sexuality, again, is marital and heterosexual. Um, and then it makes references to, um, again, what are the violations, who's violated whom, how painful is it? And then in the midst of this text, and there aren't any women's voices in the text that, are, that come to us um, without being already interpolated or recreated or fantasized, as my friend Miriam Peskowitz suggests in her book, Spinning Fantasies, um, there's a way in which the, what we get are the men telling their stories or giving voice to, voices to women to say some of the things that they need them to say. So I have some suspicion about that. OK, I've gone through some of this just to give you a sense of um, some of the issues involved. And I hope that you'll look at the text together. And what I want to sort of end by doing is to say, what, is, what do we do with this? Well, first of all, I want to say there's not just, as I said, one reading of this text or any of the biblical text or perhaps the Quranic text that we've heard. But instead, I think that one of the things that we might do is instead of looking for the definitive happy story, i.e. the feminist story, either rejecting the text or saying, you know, or discovering that really the underlying thing, get the guys off the hook, and there are different strategies that we can do, that we can take. I'm interested in a proliferation of those strategies, and in part I take, I take my lead from the multiple readings of text that the rabbis do. But also the ways in which, and here I, um, I've just read an amazing, I'm reading a, an amazing book called Liberating Scheherazade. And, um, and I'm struck that Scheherazade, who, um, by the way, is the storyteller of um, A Thousand and One Tales, and her ability to tell multiple stories is what ultimately saves her life. OK, so she keeps the king from getting bored. And maybe she lives happily ever after if you want to have the marital ending, which does make it, I guess, a comedy, right? Um, but, but Scheherazade, what interests me here is she saves her life through the proliferation of storytelling. And I also want to say that this is also a feminist strategy that, um, that many of us, and a postmodern strategy or a post-structural strategy, um, as a kind of reading practice. And what I'm interested in is how and in what ways the more stories we can tell, as opposed to getting stuck, OK, this is the right one, got it, move on, but to think about the ways in which we keep telling stories. We do it liturgically by going through the lexicon each year in in your churches or the cycle of Torah readings and synagogues. And we, in those repetitions, we come back again and again. And many of you know that when you come back again and again, you discover new things. Mm -hmm. You don't read the text the same way because as readers and as communities, these texts can come to mean different things over time. We know that in different contexts, we may highlight different things or notice different things. If we're reading a text in a feminist studies classroom or in a seminary context, maybe it's a feminist classroom in a seminary context, or in a context like this, we might see different things. Um, and I'm interested in not trying to suppress all of the different things we see, but to put them all out there. Because I think in the process of that multiplication, we get the sense of the ways in which these texts are animated or alive or living and not reified. Or, you know, I think of it reification as a kind of freeze tech, but the ways in which they are made alive and continue to be alive because we notice that they mean differently over time. Am I out of time? Yep. Indeed. So I ask you to think about animation, about Scheherazade, and I hope that in your group you will look at this text and some of the other texts that we've talked about and open yourselves up to all of the different kinds of readings that you may come up with together as a way of animating our traditions otherwise. Thank you. <laughs>